Hello and Happy New Year. Uh, today I wanted to kind of kick off the new year by sharing some of my favorite films that I watched last year. I've seen a lot of other content creators do this and a lot of them only feature movies that actually came out in 2022, but as much as I try and watch new releases, I just didn't watch enough new releases this year to make a worthwhile video, so I will just be incorporating movies from all eras that I happened to watch for the first time this year. Uh, these films are listed in no particular order, so without further ado, let's jump into it. Number one, Eraserhead. Eraserhead is a 1977 American surrealist horror film written, directed, produced, and edited by David Lynch. The film follows Henry as he resides alone in a bleak apartment surrounded by industrial gloom. When he discovers that an earlier fling with Mary X left her pregnant, he marries the expecting mother and has her move in with him. Things take a decidedly strange turn when the couple's baby turns out to be a bizarre lizard-like creature that won't stop wailing. I know, I know, I am so late to the party on this one. If you are a film lover, I feel as though this is one of those films that you know you need to watch because it's so talked about and so influential. And in this case, I would say for definitely a good reason. My partner loves horror and had been urging me to watch Eraserhead for a while now, and I honestly went in surprisingly blind for a movie that is so iconic and well-known. I had absolutely no idea what to expect, and I'm really glad I was able to go into this film that way because it is such a unique watch that is one of those films that still lingers with me, and I often still think about it. I find it so admirable what David Lynch was able to make with such a limited budget and resources, and I feel in many ways uh, is of course a display of his artistic brilliance, what he was able to craft with so little. This film is so thought-provoking and visually interesting, the tone is tense and awkward in a way I have never experienced before, and all in all left me feeling so intrigued and yet satisfied by the end. Number two, Stalker. Stalker is a 1979 Soviet science fiction art film directed by Andrei Tarkovsky with a screenplay written by Arkady and Boris Strogatsky, loosely based on their 1972 novel Roadside Picnic. In an unnamed country, at an unspecified time, there is a fiercely protested post-apocalyptic wasteland known as The Zone. An illegal guide whose mutant child suggests unspeakable horrors within the zone leads a writer and a scientist into the heart of the devastation in search of a mythical place known as the room. Anyone who enters the room will supposedly have any of his earthly desires immediately fulfilled. Okay, this may be another one where uh, any film buffs watching may be rolling their eyes that I'm only getting around to Tarkovsky now, but yes, I will admit that this was my first Tarkovsky watch experience, and yes, it was this year. <laughs> or last year, I should say. I think this film demonstrates uh, doing a lot by doing less. Stalker is a sci-fi masterpiece and thrives despite its lack of special effects or CGI. I would argue that it thrives because of its lack of special effects or CGI even. Instead, it uses good storytelling to establish an eerie and otherworldly energy. There is much inquiry about what the true intentions behind the film were and what the film is truly about. And I think that's a beautiful element of the film. It doesn't lay everything out for you, the way modern day sci-fi tends to do. And in many ways, this mirrors our real life in a very thoughtful way. Sometimes strange, beautiful, horrific things, even miracles happen and we don't know the meaning behind them. Is it a higher being, God? Are we at the wicked and random will of coincidence? Anything worth saying about this film has likely already been said, and so I will stop and leave you with that <laughs> and the fact that this film is just a beautiful masterpiece. Number three, Gigi. Gigi is a 1958 American musical romantic comedy film directed by Vincent Minnelli. The screenplay by Alan J. Lerner is based off of the 1944 novella of the same name by Colette. Weary of the conventions of Parisian society, a rich playboy and a youthful courtesan in training enjoy, enjoy a platonic friendship, but it may not stay platonic for long. 
Switching up the tempo quite a bit with a much more lighthearted, colorful, and fun film, I actually went into this film fully expecting to dislike it. I had read the novel by French author Colette and was unimpressed and underwhelmed by the story. I watched the film purely for the sake of research of a feature film script that I was writing, um, though only moments in I found myself giddy and unable to look away. Now, I know that there is a lot of valid criticism about this movie, the portrayal of a teenage girl being groomed to be a courtesan and having a grown man pursue her being showcased in such a seemingly lighthearted way is certainly something to raise an eyebrow at, and the opening song, Thank Heaven for Little Girls. Each time I see a little girl of five or six or seven, I can't resist a joyous urge to smile and say thank heaven for little girls. Being sung by an old man certainly made me uncomfortable, and yet, despite its flaws, I couldn't help but really enjoy this film. In my defense, it is just so me. I have adored Leslie Karen since I was a teen, watching her in An American in Paris and Lily, and I couldn't help but be completely and utterly swooned by her charm. And the costumes were just so divine, I must admit again uh, that I am being completely and utterly biased because every outfit Gigi wears in this film I would also wear. <laughs> in fact, I already dress similarly to the character. I also found the musical number so endearing and annoyed my partner by prancing around singing I don't understand the Parisians in a straw hat for weeks afterwards. There must be more to life than this. I don't understand the Parisians. Making love so miraculous and all in all, this film has its flaws, and it would likely not work in a contemporary context, and I can see why people don't like it. Though for as many cons as it has, I also see pros. Girly 1950s Hollywood films, I feel in many ways, were my gateway drug into more niche cinema, and Gigi just reminded me so much of the films from the 50s that I loved so dearly as a 14-year-old and still love today. Number 4. Showgirls. Showgirls is a 1995 erotic drama pulp noir film directed by Paul Verhoeven and written by Joe Esterhaz. Nomi arrives in Las Vegas with only a suitcase and a dream of becoming a top showgirl. She quickly befriends Molly, who works at a high-profile Stardust Hotel, and lands a job at a seedy strip club. A chance meeting with Crystal, the Stardust lead dancer, and her powerful boyfriend Zach brings Nomi one step closer to realizing her dreams. But as she ascends to the top, Nomi begins to wonder if it's all worth it. This is another film that may be controversial. I decided to watch Showgirls after seeing how much Broey Deschanel here on YouTube uh, praised the film. Uh, I trust Broey Deschanel's opinion on films as it often coincides with my own, so I decided to give it a shot despite its infamously bad reviews. Showgirls for me was one of those films that I just couldn't take my eyes off of. It was a film that demanded my attention. Some say that this film is so bad it's good, although I disagree. And this film is just good and misunderstood in many ways. The film is certainly not without faults. Some of the line deliveries were definitely corny, and I believe there is rightful criticism of the R-word scene, but I do feel as though the film has been misjudged. I feel as though many people, especially women, have been watching or re-watching this film in recent years and falling in love with it, and in many ways ha has earned its spot as a cult classic. Elizabeth Berkley is fully one of the most beautiful people I have ever seen on screen, and I felt completely entranced by the costumes and the makeup. <laughs> uh, this film is sexy, trashy, corny, and full of spectacle, which echoes the business and the place the movie revolves around. Show business in Vegas. Number five, Metropolis. Metropolis is a 1927 German expressionist science fiction film directed by Fritz Lang and written by Thea von Harbu in collaboration with Lang from von Harbu's 1925 novel of the same name. In a futuristic city, sharply divided between the working class and the city planners, the son of the city's mastermind falls in love with a working class prophet who predicts the coming of a savior to mediate their differences. 
going all the way back to the 1920s. This is another one of those films that sits in the back of every film buff's mind as a film they know they need to watch eventually. I got around to watching it only a couple weeks ago and, and I was completely enthralled. I believe the only silent film I had watched before this one was the original Scarface from 1932 and various Charlie Chaplin clips, though recently I've been wanting to explore the German Expressionism genre and decided Metropolis was a good place to start. Metropolis is an undeniably impressive feat, given the time period it was made and the resources at hand. Metropolis is as magnificent as it is frightening, as it eerily parallels the dystopian city landscape of our current culture. When I first went into this, I caught myself naively thinking, a silent film has no business being two and a half hours long, although I was promptly proven wrong. <laughs> I found the story completely engaging and the epic score and beautiful set design made everything flow perfectly and seamlessly. Number six, Wildwood. Wildwood is a 2021 Canadian dramatic romantic coming of age film written, produced, and directed by Bretton Hannum. In a rural East Coast trailer park, Link lives with his toxic father and younger half-brother Travis. When Link discovers his Mi'kmaq mother could still be alive, it lights a flame as the siblings embark on a quest for a better life. On the road, they meet Pazme, pow a powwow dancer drawn to Link. As the boys journey across Mi'kma'ki, Link finds community, identity, and love in the land where he belongs. I talked about this film in my video, Best Queer Coming of Age Films. This film felt deeply personal to me in many ways, and that is undoubtedly part of the reason why I enjoyed it so much, though I have no doubt that even if you don't relate uh, to the experiences of the characters within the film, that you will still enjoy this film. Breton, the director, is a fantastic voice and one that should be elevated. I emphasize greatly with the characters, especially the lead link. The cinematography was beautiful and in many ways felt as if they were plucked from my own coming of age memories. The actors in the film are brilliant as well, all around a stunning, raw, and beautiful film. Number seven, The Metamorphosis of Birds. The Metamorphosis of Birds is a Portuguese feature-length hybrid creative documentary film directed by Caterina Vasconcelos. Caterina Vasconcelos sifts through the memories and dreams of her ancestors. She presents her family's lineage, starting with her grandfather, Henrique who married her grandmother Beatriz on her 21st birthday. This is the beginning of a generational saga told in shards of memory and voiceover. This was one of the most unique films I had the pleasure of watching. The dialogue and narration is painfully poetic, paired wonderfully with stunning, innovative cinematography that together completely took my breath away. The combination of documentary storytelling and traditional storytelling was beautifully done and seamlessly interwoven. The Metamorphosis of Birds is presented as a collection of narrated memories in a way in which fiction and truth is continuously blurred. This is a film I feel compelled to watch again in order to truly soak up all of the poetry on screen. Number eight, American Psycho. American Psycho is a 2000 horror film directed by Mary Heron, who co-wrote the screenplay with Genevieve Turner, based on the 1991 novel of the same name by Brett Easton Ellis. Patrick Bateman, a wealthy investment banker, hides his psychopathic ego from his friends. Later, his illogical fantasies escalate and he submits to an uncontrollable bloodlust. This is yet another film that I almost shamefully haven't gotten around to until this year. This was a film that I kind of went back and forth on watching a lot. Um, I was curious, but I wasn't sure if I would like it because I was under the impression that it was, for a lack of better words, a movie for men. Though I was so pleasantly surprised when I watched it and discovered it was actually quite the opposite. I found this film completely genius in its own way. So many of the scenes um, are just completely hysterical, 
Christian Bale's performance as Patrick Bateman was genius and the commentary on toxic masculinity, capitalism, and the yuppie culture of the 1980s was done so well. Director Mary Heron did a fantastic job on this film and with all that Christian Bale did to ensure that he secured the role of Patrick Bateman, the Wikipedia page for this film is almost as entertaining as the film itself. The, my next video essay will be a deep dive into American Psycho and how it has been largely misinterpreted by pop culture, so keep an eye out for that. Number 9. Portrait of a Lady on Fire Portrait of a Lady on Fire is a 2019 French historical romantic drama film written and directed by Céline Sciamma. France, 1770. Marianne, a painter, is commissioned to do the wedding portrait of Eloise, a young woman who has just left the convent. Eloise is a reluctant bride-to-be, and Marianne must paint her without her knowing. She observes her every day to paint her secretly. This film is so poetically beautiful and a reminder of the importance of female voices in film. This film was beautiful, heart-wrenching, and a breath of fresh air. The imagery in this film is painfully poetic, filled to the utter brim with layers of nuance and symbolism. It is so refreshing and in a way healing to bear witness to such a poetic lesbian love story in the absence of the male gaze. To see those women fall in love in such a utterly human depiction. This film is beautiful and so, so necessary. Number 10 is Hexon. Hexon, or The Witch in English, is a 1922 silent horror essay film written and directed by Benjamin Christensen. A hybrid of documentary and fiction, this silent film explores the history of witchcraft, demonology, and Satanism. It shows representations of evil in a variety of ancient and medieval artworks, offers vignettes illustrating a number of superstitious practices, and presents a narrative about the persecution of a woman accused of witchcraft. The film ends by suggesting that the modern science of psychology offers important insights into the belief and practices of the past. I watched this film shortly after watching Metropolis because I am in my 1920s German Expressionism era <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. The film merges documentary fiction in, it, in honestly a slightly similar way that the metamorphosis of birds does. The imagery is extremely interesting and unique. It is impressive what the crew was able to achieve with limited resources. The film cleverly combines many special effects techniques including stop motion and puppetry to achieve the fantasy horror look of the satanic and demonic rituals. The film explores the prosecution of witches in the medieval witch trials and draws a surprisingly progressive parallel to the diagnosis of female hysteria. The film suggests that the women being accused of being witches were actually displaying symptoms of mental illness as many of the peculiar symptoms aligned with what the 1920s deemed as hysteria. The film also draws a parallel into the way in which witches were murdered and women diagnosed with female hysteria are locked up and mistreated. This is an idea that I believe could be even further explored today now that we no longer consider female hysteria as a real medical diagnosis. Overall, I find this film exceptionally unique and fascinating. And so that concludes my top 10 movies I watched in 2022. I'm sorry that there are no films on this list that were released in 1922, or and no, <laughs> I'm sorry that there were no films on this list that were released in 2022. I honestly have many new releases on my watch list that I need to catch up on, but I haven't watched them yet. Let me know what were some of the best films you watched in 2022 in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Bye.